Wasn't that great? That's a tough act to follow, right? Yeah, it's short this morning, I promise. But testimonies are living sermons, right? Like I say, it's pretty tough to beat that. They testify to the fact that God is always making things new. God is making people new, visions new, churches new, families new, relationships new, cities new, and God never stops. And I'd love to hear more of your stories. Whether you've already been baptized, it doesn't matter. I know that we all have a story. Now, some of us feel we don't have a story, we don't have much of a story. We just love to hear your stories. It doesn't mean that they're going to be shared on the platform, but... We just really love to hear your stories because I think you'll notice that they are encouraging, right? They they move us in our faith when we see that God is at work moving in other people's lives. What we heard in those testimonies was that Jesus showed up as a friend. They were never alone. Even when they didn't sense Jesus, Jesus was always there, even unseen, walking beside them, encouraging them, building them up. And we heard how Jesus was Savior, rescuing Taylor, Larry, and Miranda from darkness and bringing them into light, from despair into hope. And over the next couple of weeks, we are on a quest to discover and rediscover Jesus, to be surprised by Jesus, to see the different faces of Jesus, the way Jesus moves in the world and in our lives. And my hope, as I expressed last week, is that we would experience Jesus in new ways. Even those of us who have known Jesus for decades, that we would experience Jesus in new and fresh ways. Maybe it'll be less about knowing about Jesus in our heads and knowing Jesus in our hearts and even in our bodies as our friends have shared this morning. And this is so critical because when we come to know Jesus, and I think you can finish the sentence, We come to know God, right? Jesus is the face of God. God in a bod, as Mark likes to say. Jesus is the human representation of God. And last week, we looked at Jesus as friend. And for some of you, this might have felt a little bit too intimate, a little bit too casual or earthy, because for you, God is is kind of up there and distant and transcendent and maybe even somewhat on a throne. God maybe was someone to be feared. Maybe you were constantly looking over your shoulder. And yet, Jesus is the face of God. He said, I call you friends. That means God says, I call you friends. And we looked at what that meant in context, right? A friend in first century Israel at the time, so influenced by Greek culture, was like an equal to one's own self. It was like a second self, equal to one's own soul, a kindred spirit. This is the kind of intimacy that Jesus was trying to get at when he said to his followers, I call you friends. And a friend is another way of experiencing Jesus. Today we're looking at Jesus as savior. We've already heard what that looks like in real time and in real life. It looks like rescue, rescue, right in the here and now, not just after we die. Unfortunately, though, the word savior has been spiritualized through the centuries, and it's come to mean rescued from earth for heaven. But when we look at the word savior and how it's used in the gospels, and the gospels are just the four accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When we see how savior is used in the context of those gospels, we see something so different. I was actually surprised to discover that Jesus is only referred to as savior four times in the gospels. Four times, that's it. And yet, it's probably the most used title for Jesus by Christians. For for example, if you drive through the country or on some highways, you may see signs like these. Farmer's fields by the sides of the road, Jesus saves, Jesus is savior. And he does, he does, Jesus saves. And yet in the gospels, the most common title was teacher or Lord or Christ. And so if it's only used four times in the gospels, we should pay close attention to what the context was in how it was used. Mary's response when she was told that she was carrying 
Jesus. She was pregnant with Jesus. Zechariah's response when he was told that his wife, well past menopause, was pregnant with their first child and he would prepare the way for Jesus. The shepherds, when they were out in the fields and the angels came and they said, right, that's the Christmas story, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What did they understand by that when they heard the word Savior? And then the Samaritans, the group of people pretty much despised and hated by the Jews, considered not really true God followers. This is what they said when they heard the testimony of one woman and then when they heard Jesus' teaching. They said, it is no longer because of what you, that is the woman who had met Jesus, said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. What did they mean when they used this word? Did they think, oh, Jesus is going to take us to heaven when we die? Or did they understand it a different way? Was there something else being communicated? We can look at some clues in in Mary's response, if we look at that in Luke chapter 1. Starting at verse 46, this is how Mary responded when she got the news. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now how did Mary understand that word Savior? She goes on, for he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Lowly state was a real present day situation. It was her very real poverty. It was her lack of of ranking in the social order in a very patriarchal society. She goes on, surely from now on all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one, that is God, has done great things for me and holy is his name. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. The first few verses are about her, her very real circumstances, what God as Savior had done for her. But then most of her response opens up, and it's what God will do for Israel. In fact, the world, but for her, she could only understand it as Israel. God would yet show her that his plan was so much bigger, much bigger than Israel. But this is what God will do for Israel in real time, in real circumstances. The hungry will be fed. The powerful will no longer oppress. The downtrodden will find liberation. This was very real to them under the oppression of Rome. And this Savior's saving is evident in the social realities of the daily grind, of affording food. In Mary's response, at least, Salvation is not heaven when we die, or at least not just heaven when we die, but it's wholeness, it's enoughness, it's liberation and rescue here and now. The word salvation actually comes from the Latin word salvus, which means being made whole, uninjured, safe, in good health, that sort of understanding. Salvus wasn't mainly about leaving this life, but about healing this life. Miranda and Larry and Taylor's lives were healed and are being healed in this life now. Salvus describes the biblical vision of God's justice and mercy and peace and well-being. And this is the dream of the saved earth. This is God's vision, life as God intends it, where oppression ends and mercy reigns where violence ceases to exist and we all live safely and we all have enough. In Mary's and Zechariah's and the shepherds and the Samaritans' understanding, Jesus is a savior who brings this dream to reality, the fulfillment of the dream of their ancestors that they prayed for and longed for and waited for. Here's an inscription. Oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. A thousand years before this, at least, the prophet Isaiah had this same vision. This is the vision they held on to. This is the vision they were waiting for. He said this, he, meaning God, shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Today we would say they would turn their bombs into combines. 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now it takes a wild imagination to imagine a world without war, doesn't it? Where military budgets are converted into health care and affordable food and housing and education. This is God's dream. This is Jesus' vision for the world. The vision he invites us into. And not just for later, though that is a reality, but for now. Salvation is now. You see, in first century Israel, savior wasn't a religious word. It was a political word. I'm kind of amused when I hear people say that uh, faith shouldn't be political. I think what they mean by that is partisan because Jesus was political. Political in the truest sense of the word comes from the Greek word polis, which is this concept of the ideal city where everything works, where everything, everyone is cared for. That word, that ideal has been corrupted. The title savior Son of God was a political word. His, Jesus' title was political. His inaugural address was political. He challenged the empire. His death was political. It was a state-sponsored execution. Don't be mistaken, Jesus is political. Savior, or Soter, is, is the title given to all major figures, from Hercules to Caesar. Look at this first century inscription. You're going to have to trust me on this. <laughs> it refers to the good news, the gospel of Caesar, the imperial savior, a son of God, even God of God who brought peace to the world. Do those declarations sound at all familiar to you? They're not borrowed from the gospel story and used in politics. They're borrowed from politics and used in the gospel story. When Luke and John use the word savior, they are being political in the best sense of the word. Political meaning the ideal for all. It's a very this world declaration. And when Mary uses the word savior, she's being political in the best sense of the word. She's issuing this political manifesto which usurps all of Rome's claims that oppression and violence is the way to a better life. Rather, it is Jesus' savior who will usher in the better life, where there'll be justice and equity and a home for everyone. With Jesus as savior, life will be beautiful and there'll be enough for all in the here and now, just, not just in the afterlife. This is Jesus' vision. Maybe as Barbara Brown Taylor says, Jesus as savior has more to do with living life than escaping life. And so when Mary, Zechariah, the shepherds, and the Samaritans called Jesus Savior, Soter, that's a statement of resistance. Jesus, not empire's might, will rescue the world. Jesus, not empire's might, will satisfy the hungry. Jesus' upside-down way will subvert the empire's system of power. Jesus, not empire, is Savior. Jesus, not empire, is to be worshiped. Jesus' as Savior is indeed about the forgiveness of sin. We heard that this morning. And we do need rescuing from our sin, our individual sin, but also our collective sin. But there are other things that we need to be saved from. Hamburgers made from vegetables. <laughs> no, 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 no. They might taste good, friends, but we cannot call them hamburgers, right? Just saying. But seriously, there are other things that we need to be rescued from, right? Victimization, marginalization, meaninglessness, suffering, nihilism, sexual predation. The list just keeps on going. We heard some of them in the testimonies this morning. I love what Irenaeus, the second century theologian said. He said, the glory of God is... What do you think? What do you think the glory of God is? <laughs> the human being fully alive. It's what God revels in, what God declares and magnifies. 
This is what God is like, the human being fully alive. It's Larry and Miranda and Taylor experiencing life to the full, experiencing rescue, experiencing hope. I love the, uh, the Celtic understanding of salvation. It's so earthy, it's so beautiful, it's so raw, it's so real. Everything is holy. Every moment, everything, and everyone. Christ came to reveal the sacredness of all things. Don't you love that? It's here, it's now. And you might be wondering, well, if Jesus is savior who brings this dream of wholeness and enoughness for all reality, why isn't it a reality then? Jesus has come and gone and there's still people hungry and there's still war. And that's a fair question. Jesus as savior showed us God's heart, showed us God's vision, launched this vision, and then invited us into this audacious vision of wholeness and enoughness and equity. What a gorgeous vision. And in inviting us through the power of the Holy Spirit, which we're gonna hear more about next week, he's inviting us in to this vision of wholeness and enoughness, to be his saving, rescuing presence. To be those who labor for justice and equity, to continue the mission that he started. We, we are Jesus to the world. We are Jesus' second self. We are those who are called to quiet, persistent resistance. Rachel's gonna come and just create space for us so that we can reflect for a moment on the magnitude of this, on what it means for each of us. Jesus as Savior longs for us to be fully alive, longs for you to be fully alive to be free from the baggage of our mistakes and, and quite frankly, someone else's brokenness, to be free from that. Jesus as Savior is offering forgiveness, release from guilt and shame, a life of living fully alive, a life of seeing and honoring the sacredness in each other. Jesus as Savior longs to restore your image, to make you whole, to erase the lies that you have believed about yourself, that others have told you, to free you from having to pretend or cover up, to be who you're not. Jesus wants to free you from that. Jesus' as Savior calls you friend, Friend, if you want to know Jesus, if you're tired of running away, Jesus as Savior is holding out his hand, his hand of invitation, his hand of rescue, and inviting you into this dream for humanity. And Jesus, his friend, is waiting for your friend invite. So I just wonder if we could pause for a moment. And just ask ourselves, what do I need Jesus to rescue me from? What baggage, bondage, belief system do I need to escape? What ideas about God or self do I need to be free from? Where might you sense that you're being called into Jesus' rescue mission? Let's just sit with that and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. If you're here 
and you want to know more about Jesus. You want to know Jesus like Larry and Miranda and Taylor do. If you want to experience salvation, wholeness, and restoration, our prayer team is always at the front. They'd just be happy to chat with you, to pray with you. Johanna is going to be here at the front if you want to speak with her, and I'll be in the atrium. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. And I'd just love to close us now with a blessing. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in God, so that you may overflow, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, friends, overflowing with hope.